like to take a cement fix Be a standing cinema Dress my friends up just for show See them as they really are Put the people in my brain To your pants to have a go I'd like to be a gallery Put you all inside my show Andy Warhol looks a scream Hang him on my wall Hello and welcome to Globetrotting. It's me, Dana Gillespie, here at the Temple of Art and Music. And as ever, because I wear glass bangles, I have to wrap my bangles up so there's no sound complaints. But I was once told by a very famous musician, Pandit Dinesh, she said to me, for him, that one of the most erotic sounds in the world is the sound of the bangles, the glass bangles under the bedclothes. Anyway, but we don't want to be clonking. So I'm here with a very special guest who I met a few years ago. I'm going to have to ask him when it was because my, I can't remember, because he directed uh, three documentaries on Bowie. We will get to Bowie, but I'd like you first to meet Francis Watley. Waitley. Waitley. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> slap my wrist. And Waitley. He's, Waitley. Waitley. He's, how stupid of me. And he's sitting here with his son, Ivo. <laughs> so here we are in the Temple of Art and Music. How can I? Apologies, but hey, you know, this is kind of where this, this is like being in family. Now, I want to know, we'll get onto the Bowie thing in a little while. You have been a director of documentaries for ages. I mean, how did you start? Oh, how did I start? I was, I was, um, I was a Chinese porcelain expert, actually, in really? Hong Kong. Yeah. Really? I, I worked for the that. auction houses, and I got very tired of selling lovely, beautiful things to rich people. So I thought, well, what can I do with art that doesn't have any sort of commerce involved? So someone said you could work in television. And so I thought, oh... I didn't really watch television then, and I don't watch that tele much television now. But anyway, I thought that would be a nice idea. So I started and I became a clerk at the BBC about 30 years ago. And I ordered stationery, and basically I worked up from there. I'm terribly impressed about you knowing about, can you, uh, Chinese porcelain? I mean, if there was a Ming vase here, would you know it was Ming or well, whatever? Prob probably, yes. Oh. I'd probably be able to do that. So then from being a clerk at the BBC, you went up the ladder. I went up the ladder. So you go from a clerk to, I was a, a rat, which was a research assistant trainee. Okay. And then I became a researcher, and then I became an assistant producer, and then I became a producer, and then I became a producer and a director, and now I'm a series producer. Right. Of all these roles, which are, are your favourite in the kind of creating world? Oh, Directing the very bottom. Or no, the very bottom, because I had no pressure. <laughs> It was much nicer. That's true, actually. The I get all the, all the gigs. I yeah. go, go on all the trips. I often did the interviews, but I had no pressure. It was much the nicest. Well, you, Francis interviewed me while we were doing the third part of the Bowie thing. Cause That's there right. Was, what were the first two? Yes, yeah, so I did the first film called Five Years when David was still alive and he was in sort of seclusion and retirement at that stage. Mm -hmm. So he did sort of help me a little from behind the scenes. But he didn't appear, but he was very pleased with the film at the end. Oh, good. And, um, well, he wrote to me and he said, can I see a copy of the film before it goes out? And I wrote back, of course not. There's no question of it. <laughs> and he wrote back, lol. And I wrote back, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have it delivered to your house so that you can watch it at exactly the same time in New York as we watch it in England. And we did that. And he uh, emailed me the second it finished and said, I'm very proud of you. Which was a huge thing for me, because I was a huge, huge Bowie fan. Well, so, yeah, that meant a lot. Millions are, let's yes, face it. Yes, that meant a lot. Then the second one. Then the second one, after he, he, he died, um, uh, I made another film called The Last Five Years, which was about the last five years of his life. And then I thought the missing piece, actually, was uh, the first years of his life, when it was a series of failures. And that's where Dana comes in. <laughs> 
Well, mm. I knew him when, let's face it, when he was still a bit folky in strumming his 12... Well, I knew him from, when was it, 1964. So you I knew was, him at the Marquee, didn't you? Yeah, I think I was 15. Underage. 14, I believe. 14, maybe 14. <laughs> underage, but hey, I didn't care, nor did he, and nor did anyone else, actually. But, you know, we were all just youngsters starting out and all with dreams of being actually songwriters. Yeah. That was the thing. You had to sing in order to get your songs across, but both of us had these dreams of being songwriters, and we both played 12-string guitar, because if you're not yep. that good a guitarist, if you have a 12-string, it makes a bigger noise. It so makes a bigger noise, it makes it much easier. Yeah, I mean, actually, I really liked the episode that you did. I mean, it has been said, you did leave out a couple of people from the... Uh, can I'm we afraid I did. We, we can, we can. I think it's only right that we do, and I know exactly who you're talking about. Well, yes, let, I have to say, you know, Bowie and I had the same manager, Tony DeFries, who became very... It was a disastrous relationship at the end, but at the beginning, it was yeah. great. It was what Bowie wanted, and Bowie brought me on board to be with him. And, of course, the other one was his wife, Angie, Bowie's yeah. wife, Angie, who was really instrumental in helping, but that sort of got left out of the documentary. Can I ask you that? You but can, you can. It's, it's, it's all very political. But yes, they were both hugely influential and it was a sort of a mission on my part not to have included them. You know, Angie was an enormous influence. Yeah. And as was Tony. And yeah. Well, what it, do you know, I never called him Tony. I always called him DeFries. Yes. Even I remember in those even days. to me you called him DeFries. I've yes. never called him, well, I know about 20 Tonys, so it just gets confusing. Yeah. And it saddens me when Bowie fans think, you know, that both of them were nightmares and monsters and how dreadful. They, can't, they wouldn't have been monsters else at the beginning, otherwise Bowie himself would not have, have chosen DeFries to be the manager and he wouldn't have married Angie. Let's no, face it. no, no, no. There was obviously an attraction, and they both, you know, made David almost certainly what he became. Yes, or certainly made him just helped him along helped the him line. along the along the way, definitely. As did Mick Ronson by As adding the Ronson. electric guitar. Yeah, lifted his songs to another level. Yes. So I mean, I think Bowie fans should be slightly more understanding about the timeline of when things were good. I mean, as we all know, let's say marriages break down at the beginning. Obviously, you, yeah. you're happy with who you marry, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And then things go wrong as exactly. they did. And I remember you telling me, I think this is right, isn't it, that you went to Glastonbury. Because yes. I'm making a film about Glastonbury now for its Ooh. 50th anniversary, which is obviously not its 50th anniversary anymore, because okay. that was two years ago. So it's now its 52nd anniversary. Right. However, yes, we have a little bit about um, Linda Lewis, who played oh, and do, exactly and she played at that festival where David played uh -huh. um, but hers was recorded he wasn't though no he wasn't recorded I think maybe somebody had a cassette machine because you have to remember yeah. they were very untogether my memories of it because it was the first year when the big silver pyramid was up that's right my yeah. memories was that all the stage crew were off their rockers on whatever yep and and the and I think the, the sound was a bit kind of or the equipment there were problems and people yeah. played longer than they should have maybe it's very difficult to really be disciplined when you're running yeah. a festival so David missed missed his slot or he was waiting. I think he missed many slots, yeah. He, so in the end they said, oh, we have got no room. So he, the only chance he had was to go on at five in the morning. That's right, at five in the morning. So did you watch it? Because you were oh, yes. with Angie, so that's well, how I the connection is. Well, I don't remember Angie being there. Apparently Angie was there, but... DeFries thinks no. Okay. And I, I think no too, because I remember, but hey, you know, we've all got different memories over this and, you know... Certainly people who went to Glastonbury have, <laughs> yeah. I remember that DeFries, Bowie and I went by train and in the next carriage was Bob Grace from Chrysalis Music That's who was right, doing yeah. the publishing. And we landed in wherever it is that you get out, not realising that there was a blasted walk of about three yeah. miles. Yeah, it's a long way And there was Castle no taxis, Carrie, yeah. yes. So with, DeFri with Bowie carrying his guitar and he had a big floppy hat on a wide bag, Oxford bag trousers. <laughs> and we walked there. DeFries was the only sensible one and had booked a hotel room. Everyone else just kind of... I, I don't know whose tent Bowie crawled into, but... <laughs> Not yours. No, I wasn't. In the end, I decided to go and sleep with De Vries in his room <laughs> if you wanted a bath, you know. And, you, and it got kind of coldish and it was muddy as, you know. But it was very early days. Glastonbury wasn't that famous then. No, was this just, was the second, second festival ever. And so. De Vries kept saying, don't do it. And Bowie was insistent. 
And all the people at five in the morning who had kind of obviously had heavy nights, they come crawl out of their tents. And I remember this very clearly, they're crawling out of their tents and there's this lone person on stage singing. And at one point he's singing, the sun machine is it's going down, down and we're gonna, gonna have a party. party. Uh -huh. And the sun was coming yes, up I think and it. people were all just sitting in their tents watching this lone perf performer. Thinking, who is this guy? Yeah, you know. they didn't know who he yeah. was. How great that you're doing that, that documentary. Yeah, so it needs to be told as a famous place. Yeah, well, it's a sort of social, political history of Glastonbury Festival and how it reflects Britain. Is so, that what you're working on now? Yes, I'm just finishing that now. When's so, it going to be available on, for... On, on, on the, I gather it's, 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 it's a two-hour film and mm -hmm. it goes out uh, on the BBC and then sold around the world uh, to a week before this year's festival, so in June. So, am I right in thinking you're freelance now and I'm not freelance, with the... Yeah, yeah. Are you happy to be free of the BBC or was... Well, they must have been good times. They were good times. I have nothing but good things to say about the BBC. Um, you know, I was sort of the last man standing in terms of having a job at the BBC and this Glastonbury film and the last series I've just finished actually um, on Andy Warhol, who I know you know as well. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they were for the BBC, so I don't feel like I've quite left yet. So ask no. me this in a year and no, then right. I'll let you know what the freelance Have you finished was. the Andy Warhol one? Yeah, the Andy Warhol um, went out on the BBC in, in January. Called? What's it called? It's called um, Warhol um, and America. Okay, so I must have missed that. It's on the iPlayer. It's on the iPlayer oh, now. That's far too yeah. modern for far me. Far too but modern, I'll but yeah. I have to wait. Francis, today you see is my 73rd birthday, and Francis just gave me the box set of all the Bowie things. I've waited a couple of years for that. You have I'm waited really a happy. Of years. I'll have to wait till I see you again and you give me the Andy Warhol thing. I can thing. give you Andy Warhol. Although tonight in the show, we are going to do Andy Warhol because that's the song that Bowie that's the wrote song da for David me. David wrote for you, yeah. Yeah. I'd never called him David either. It was always Bowie. You always called him Bowie, yeah. Well, to other people, to him, I did call him David, but again, I know about 10 Davids, so people don't know who I'm talking about. And when I first met him, he wasn't Bowie. No, he, he was, was Jones. Jones, yes. Yeah. So yeah, now, Jones is not so good, is no, it? No, oh no. So going backwards <laughs> from, from Glastonbury, before that, am I right in thinking that you did Dolly Parton I in did, the nicest I, possible way. I, I did do Dolly Parton, yes, um, which is now on HBO. I, this sounds like a sort of plug, doesn't it, no, for my hey, work? plug um, away, plug I don't, I don't, away. Yeah, um, anyway, so yes, we did a film about Dolly Parton, which was, which was wonderful, and she is, I mean, she is very disarming, and she is as wonderful as everyone says she is. She puts her hand on your knee as soon as you meet her. The hand goes on the knee, she looks you in the oh, eyes, she asks you about your children, and it's, it's wonderful. And, yeah. and she's a great songwriter. That is the thing. I've always appreciated good songwriting. I like singers who sing their own material. Yeah. And yeah. it's great if somebody else covers a song. But, you know, that's what she's amazing about. And I think that's what works so well in that film is that we did a lot of her 60s songwriting songs, like The Bridge, like Down From Dover, all those songs that no one really has heard of now because we all think of Nine to Five and, you know, Islands Jolene. in the Stream and Jolene. Yes. But some of the early ones were exceptionally good. And I think no one talks to her about those. So I think we got on because she, she saw someone who was interested in her as a songwriter. So going back, so we're going backwards in Francis's career. So we've gone us back to Dolly. What happened before Dolly? Dolly was Dolly, before Dolly was you. Yes. Oh, right, OK. So then what happened before Bowie? Because you've done some other ones, I know. I have, I have. So I did... Um, thrillers. Thrillers. I did uh, um, and, a, a and thing on... Brag. You can be as bold as you like. Oh, I see. Thrillers. I, I was thinking we did do a sort of thriller with about Kim Philby, actually, and his relationship okay. with his best friend and how he sort of betrayed his best friend. Oh, right, yes. Which, um, which I enjoyed very much. But no, I've, I've, I've made things on the bottled water industry. I've made it on the 1998 uh, World Cup in France. Okay. I've made something on, on tanks. Ooh. I still don't know a Sherman from a honey, but there we go. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, what else? Um, then I did quite a few music films, but then okay. I did The History of Modern Britain with Andrew Marr. And yeah, I've just been very, very lucky because, yeah. I, so I had when a very eclectic. Okay. When I, you finish Glastonbury, have you got any plans for the future? I'm, I'm trying to cook up something, but 
Uh, not. Have you got it in your plan? But you've got it in my plan. But you want to be a bit discreet about it. A little bit discreet, okay. maybe at the moment, because otherwise I think I'll jinx it, and then it won't yeah, happen. I do understand. I, it's actually I was I shouldn't have asked you that because I personally think it's never good to talk about something that you haven't done. Yeah. Because a million things could happen, and uh, it may not happen, and you might find a different project. I that might comes find a different project. All I know is that I get a long time with my son um, over the summer holiday, which is what I always like, because well, I there's never, nothing better than him. I have never forgotten Ivo. You know, I'm not a child person, sorry, mm. Ivo. I don't have kids myself. My children are my albums, and I've mm. always said I'd rather be in a studio making <laughs> records, which is why we're doing and recording. Bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, then. Tonight we're recording my 73rd album, which is going to be interesting, so I hope it goes all right. But I never forgot either. And as you know, whenever I've sent yeah. you a text, I've always it's asked It's always that. about him, yeah. Yes. yeah. And I'm very It's touched. all about Ivo. <laughs> it is always about so, Ivo. Can I just ask you, Ivo, though, I know you're kind of not that nuts about being on camera. You're how old? I'm 13. Do you want to follow in your father's footsteps, or have you got... Oh. Um, <laughs> Have you got plans for something else? Have you got any kind of career plans? Uh, not really, no. Just wait to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Do you play an instrument, by the way? Do I you see? I used to play uh, euphonium. Ooh, that's that's unusual. But <laughs> used to, but that means you don't anymore. No. <laughs> no. Oh, well, the instrument I want to learn is the theremin. What is the theremin? Well, it's that electronic thing, and it's sort of I can't really describe. It. You put your hand against it, and it makes weird noises. Um, I shouldn't really talk about it, but I've, it's, it's, it's something you buy a machine called a theremin and you move your hand about, and it, wow. it's quite okay. difficult to play apparently. Okay, you should investigate. Have it, yeah, you should you should have bought it for your seventy third birthday. For you know, you should have tried it out tonight. <laughs> well, it's, no, instead I've got some mad balloons. This whole place is going to be has been turned into a sort of birthday madness. Well, so it's I'm a great honour to be here on no, such a big day. It's an honour that you and no. Ivo have come along, and I hope you can stay for a bit of concert. Absolutely, we can. Fantastic. So, <laughs> Francis, I want to. <laughs> I have to. Waitley. Waitley. Yeah. Waitley. Yep. Why? Why do I call you Watley? It's because I'm slightly dyslexic. No, it's fine. I've been called Watley all my life, so I'm just used to it. And really? normally, when people say it, I say whatever. But I thought as this was being recorded, I might just sort of interject. No, put me, put me right and slap my <laughs> wrist. But Waitley, I mean, because I'm usually called Dana or Dana, and I, ref I tell the notes, Dana rhymes yes. with Spanner. Yeah, you see, I got it wrong when I, I first met you, so I think we're, we're quits here. Oh, thank God, we're equal now. <laughs> so I want to say thank you to Francis and Ivo for, for coming down here to this mad bonkers temple of art and music. And we're just setting up and getting ready because the concert is about to start in about an hour, but first we got food being served up by the wonderful two star Michelin, two Michelin star guy John Burton Race. So it's all happening down here at the TAM, as we call it. So from us three on happy the sofa. Happy birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> Another year older and probably no wiser. Till next time, goodbye. Andy Warhol looks a scream. Hang him on the wall. Me and you 
You think about paint and you think about glue What a jolly boring thing to do 